I think most of you know about the Price Center, but just to share, our mission is to develop ideas and illuminate strategies to improve the quality of life for people living in low-income urban communities. And we fulfill this mission through research, student learning, community engagements, and events like the speaker series, where we bring in uh, scholars who are thinking about issues where social innovation approaches might actually be the right way to go to deliver social impact in a way that we haven't done before. Our special speaker today, Sonal Shah, is the executive director of the Beck Center at Georgetown. She's an economist, entrepreneur. She spent her career focused on economic policy and actionable innovation in both the public and private sectors. Um, she has led policy innovations at the White House for President Obama and the Treasury Department for President Clinton, among many other things. Uh, we had the opportunity to have Sonal Shah came to USC about three years or so ago. Um, as part of a series where we were introducing the field of social innovation to our Price community. And, you know, we're so excited to see all the work she's done now at the Beck Center um, and to have, I, I really appreciated our initial conversations this morning about kind of how we're thinking about things and opportunities for us to partner going forward. Her background is, is unique and diverse, as you might expect, someone in the field of social innovation. She's an international economist and she's set up helped set up the Central Bank in Bosnia. She worked in post-conflict reconstruction in Kosovo, Im implemented poverty reduction strategies in Africa, and helping to deal in some of the financial crises in Asian and Latin America over the years. In the private sector, she's led technology and civic engagement and impact investing initiatives at Google as the head of global development initiatives. And she set up and ran the environmental strategy, including investing in clean technologies at Goldman Sachs. So her experience has been across a broad set of sectors and experiences. Um, I think in, in many ways she's known in our field, social innovation, at, when she was the deputy assistant to the president uh, for President Obama, and she helped found the White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. Um, she served as President uh, Obama's, uh, or on President Obama's transition board leading technology innovation and government reform groups. So please welcome me in welcoming Sonal Shah. You know, before I go into kind of where the research, where are the opportunities, and especially from a research perspective in social innovation, what I thought I'd give you is like a, a five minute background on just what we started at the White House and why. Uh, when I joined uh, the president's transition team in 2008, the goal was to really, we, I was really working on innovation broadly, so economic innovation, technology innovation. And then as we started to dig into the research, we realized that there was a lot happening in the social sector. And how do we actually think about innovation in the social sector? And how can the government play a role in innovation in the social sector? Uh, as many of you know, and as you've seen in your own uh, lives, innovation's happening all the time, and especially in the social sector. Sometimes we don't talk about it, but it's happening. And it's sometimes not seen as much as it is uh, talked about in communities, it's talked about in cities, it's talked about in, in the different uh, sectors or places you might be in. So we created the Office of Social Innovation and we actually proposed it to the president. We actually hadn't even created when the president took office on January 20th and said, you know, it would be great if we had an office on social innovation to galvanize the energy that already existed in the sector. So not necessarily creating something new, but seeing that there was already energy, how do we give it a voice? How do we accelerate the process of, of ch making change happen? And what are, the, what are the ways to do that? So we proposed that, and in 2009, after he took over on January 20th, I get a call. I had gone back to Google, because that's where I worked, and I take a leave of absence. And I get a call that says, hey, that idea you proposed, would you like to start it? Um, so you don't actually say no to the president, so you just kind of pack up and you leave and you drive across country. And the way we actually thought about it and, it, and it's hard to think about social innovation from a government side, to be fair. So there's, if you're in a community and if you're in a city and if you're in a town, it's very easy to think about how do I think about solving these problems differently. When you're sitting at the federal government level, it's like you're almost not touching people. <laughs> You're kind of just touching processes and institutions. And how do we think about social innovation at a federal level that allows that to come all the way to cities and states and communities in which people can make those changes happen? And so we took a 
top down and a bottom up approach, right? So we have we were called the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. Do not underestimate the civic participation corner of that, which was very important. One is just understanding what was happening in communities already. So tasked agencies to say, where are these innovative models? What's happening in communities? Bring those in. How do we champion those ideas? At least start thinking about it. What are the things we should be thinking about? Um, and then bringing in institutional structures to say, how do we fund slightly differently? So we have spent lots of money, we spend billions of dollars. Could we fund a little bit on the innovation side? Who are those innovative ideas? Where are those innovative ideas? And then thinking about the institutional structures across government and how does the government organize itself around innovation? So one was we created the Social Innovation Fund. It was only a $50 million fund, but boy, do people talk about $50 million as if it was $50 billion? But the idea around that was using the concept of the Social Innovation Fund to then get the rest of the government to think about it. So what we did is we had 24 events in the first year with the President and First Lady to talk about social innovation. So, you know, it's funny, the most valuable time of, uh, of any president is their time. <laughs> Right? How much, how much can they give? Will they have an event? Will they do that? So 24 events in a year with the president and the first lady is a pretty significant amount of time to get from the president and first lady. But to push the idea, and everybody thinks it's important because now the president's talked about it 24 times. Right? That's, that's a, a way of just thinking about how to push ideas and, and to use that time effectively. Second was using that $50 million to bring philanthropy, local governments, local philanthropy, and I don't mean like just large national philanthropies, but community foundations, community organizations to the table to talk about why social innovation mattered. So the convening power of government was just as important as the president's time, and that, that was the second piece. And the third is that we gave power to the government itself to try things. So. Um, most places in government, nobody wants to test out new ideas because something goes wrong, they get in trouble, right? That's every day in life, that's everybody's life, right? So how do we give them the freedom to test new ideas? When things go wrong, we took the heat for it, so they had the ability to try innovations and approaches, whether it was technological innovation, so prizes and challenges for new ideas to come through, using technology, uh, innovative uses of technology, whether it's, uh, whether it's everything from apps to integrating data, to open data, but how would you think about that? And then, and, and then the third uh, was just really giving them the space to even come up with their own ideas and give us room to do that. So we used to run an innovation council in government to, to make that happen. So that was kind of how we approached social innovation and the government. And again, a lot of it is stuff that the government didn't do, right? It was already happening in communities already. And I think what the challenge for us is to think about in today's world is, how do you think about social innovation where the federal government may not be the biggest player, but there's so much already happening and already taking place to galvanize that energy to do things in cities, to do things in communities, to do things at state levels? Because it doesn't have to be the federal government, right? It didn't even exist in 2008 and it was already happening and it may not exist in 2017, but it doesn't mean it stopped happening. And in fact, I think it's happening globally, not just locally anymore. So global, local. So things that are happening in, you know, something is happening in, um, in India, something's happening in Kenya, something's happening in China, something's happening in, uh, Latin, in, in, in Colombia. How do we bring those ideas together to see what's happening and what we can learn across the board. And I think that's our challenge uh, that we need to think about as we think about social innovation. So I wanna, I wanna uh, put three ideas uh, for you all to think about and then I hope you will ask any other burning questions uh, you have and I will be as honest as I can be um, and you'll find out that I'm not very good at holding back so I'm happy to be uh, frank about the conversations. But one, um, I think one of the things that we felt very challenged with when we were in government is data and information that let us know whether an idea had succeeded or failed or whether the idea was a good idea and we should push it because it was something we needed to push. But there was very little research on social innovation <laughs> when we were there. So people would be like, change policy and do that. But when you're a federal government, changing policy is extraordinarily hard. 
So how do we do research effectively that allows us, what should we be pushing? Where should we be leaving room for ideas? Where should we be rethinking ideas? What should those pushes be from a research perspective? And I know there's a lot of good research happening here, but it's I think also happening in other parts of the, of the country. So how do we think about homelessness differently? What are the challenges of housing policy? How do we think about housing policy? What needs to change? What are incentive structures that are working or are not working? And really thinking through how does the government change change policy when you may have good points of reference, but you need to understand if those points of reference are multiple points of reference, whether it's just one good idea, or whether there was 100 ideas like that. So that's why research, and that's why universities, and that's why kind of the research methodologies matter a lot. Because if you're changing a policy for a city, like LA, you don't want to just change a policy based on one reference point or two reference points or 10 reference points. You actually need to understand why you're changing it and for whom you're changing it. And are we going to adapt it if we find that what we did and what we intended to do and what the unintended consequences are are not equal? So we need to understand that on a regular basis and how do you think about that? So research matters a lot in this case and understanding what that research is matters a lot. So thinking about that and what that looks like, and as you all think about your own studies and what you're interested in, think about participating in some of that research that's happening because that research matters and it'll teach you how to think through the problem. Maybe it may be frustrating because, you know, I, I um, 100% am with all of you that you're impatient. I, I, you know, the older you get, the less p patience you actually have, even though at younger ages you feel like you're the only ones with impatience. But... I think your impatience matters, but understanding patiently how to do that research and understanding how that data comes across and what happens is almost just as important because sometimes we can leave a lot of unintended consequences if we don't understand why we're doing it and for whom we're doing it and how we're affecting people. And no, when we do research, it also affects people directly. So when you go ask a series of questions to somebody, you've now just changed their perspective on something. Whether you like it or not, it happens. And so understanding that makes a difference. And, and it's not, there's no, um, what's the right thing? There's no, oh, I just was asking the question. I wasn't really trying to preempt them on anything. But you, you, you know, um, in physics, there's this terminology that when you hit a, a ripple effect changes everything along the way. It's the same in, in life, in social sector. It's like when you do something, it changes along the way. So I'll give you an example just to illustrate this. Um, there was a study internationally where we were looking at, um, this is when I was in the Treasury Department, we were looking at how we would give uh, money to different organizations in a particular country. And what we were trying to do is trying to use different proxies for that research. So something like thatched roofs versus tin roofs. So thatched roofs, usually families are poor, and tin roofs, usually families are slightly richer. So how we might allocate money without having to go door to door, could we use, um, could we use satellite photography to understand how to do that? So here's how smart communities are. They figured out exactly what was going on. They realized that the, the families that had thatched roofs were getting more money than the families that had tin roofs. Two years later, every family had a thatched roof. Right? But I, I, I use that as an example of understanding that families and communities understand that even if when we are experimenting, it is their life. And recognizing that our experimentation also has an impact in someone's life is why understanding research methodology matters a lot. Understanding what you're trying to do, how we're going to impact those lives and what that looks like, understand that because um, we might be doing it for the right reasons, but it has a real impact on people's lives as that happens. So uh, on, on that part of the research, I think it's supremely important. The second and the challenge, and I think we have, is to think about entrepreneurial activity in large research processes. So how do we be entrepreneurial and at the same time manage long-term research, right? And how many of you struggle with that? Or think about that, right? Both of those matter simultaneously, right? If you're the entrepreneurial uh, type and you want to move quickly and you want to try things quickly, it's also knowing on a regular basis what's happening, what are the changes you're seeing, how might you do that? If you're a, if you're a business, and you say, well, businesses operate so fast. If you're Facebook, if you're Amazon, you're operating so quickly. But you know what they are doing? They're also collecting data, and they're managing to your behavior on a constant basis. They know your behavior better than sometimes you know your own behavior. So understanding that that's what they're doing with it, it's not just that the business is moving quickly. They're just trying to sell you goods. 
and they're constantly selling you goods. They're also doing research. And they're doing it for different purposes, which is to sell you more goods and how many more things you buy. How many of you buy books on Amazon? Right? Every time you buy a book, they tell you, here are other books you might want to buy because people that bought this type of book also bought those types of books. And then as you pick or not pick one of those books, the next p book you pick, they are analyzing that methodology like this, and they're now seeing where your pattern fits, and each of your patterns is gonna be slightly different. It's like you bought these three books, so therefore you might like these types. You bought these three books, and the more books you buy, the more they're tapering to you, but they have a common outcome. They have one outcome that every business is looking for. They want you to buy more stuff from them. Right? So every time we compare to a business, and we're like, social innovation should more, be more like business, what are we selling? Are we selling a product? Are we trying to make more profit? Or are we trying to change lives? Because in order for us to make that comparison, we have to be very clear that one group is selling a product. And I'm not, I'm not actually not complaining about the product. I'm a buyer of those products. But they're trying to keep me online to buy more stuff. And they have a very common goal in mind, it's an, which I'm calling as outcome. That outcome is extraordinarily important because if I know what the outcome is of what I need to do, then I can change my behavior to get to that outcome. I need you to buy more stuff. And how do I keep you online to buy more stuff? That's clarity of outcome. Similarly, I think in the social sector, we need to ask that question. What's the outcome we're trying to achieve in every program, in any organization? What are we managing to? Is the outcome poverty reduction? Is it poverty reduction for the whole population? Is it poverty reduction for a percentage of the population? Is it for 73,000 households in one community? Like we have to be very clear because that's what the business community actually does. They're very clear about the, the group that they're talking about, what they're asking you to buy and what they're asking other people to buy. We, we need to think the same way and we need to think about what are the aspects of business that should fit, filter into social and what are the aspects of social that need to filter into business. And they're not the same all the time. So I think as you think about this, just think about when you compare to the business sector, when you're impatient in that process, understand what of that you're trying to bring in. I think organizational processes are important. I think how they look at data and how they think about individual cons customers and consumers is important. Um, but the outcome's very different for us. We're not, we're not necessarily looking at selling you more stuff. I want you to save more money, or I want you to um, you know, get a better education, and those factors change in communities on a regular basis. So I grew up in Houston, um, and, and, you know, in one day with one hurricane and one flooding incident, everybody's lives changed. So no matter what I was doing in that period of time, something has changed, and I have to manage to that change. In New Orleans 15 years ago, when Katrina happened, everybody's life changed in a city for many, for other cities like Houston, they took almost a third of those of, of Katrina um, uh, communities that had to leave and they moved to Houston. So that also changed for another city. So those changes affect how you might think about social innovation and social entrepreneurship differently. And we have to just keep in mind that those factors change on a fairly regular basis. And the third piece I'd like to, to kind of emphasize is the structures are changing. So before, and, and for those of you that are in schools, you see this, right? So you're in public policy, you're in education, you're in social services, you're in healthcare, you're in multiple places, and the government is also organized very similarly. I think universities are much more cross-functional than, than government is, but you solve your problems in your little verticals that you're in. However, those verticals are changing, right? What if I need to look at education and health data together? It's not just about education or health, it's about education and health. And then factor that with transportation. Can I get to the school? Can I get to, the, can I get to my job? Can I get to, all of that is now a person, we're starting with a person, and each person has a layer of things. Everything from education to health to transportation to housing, all of those filter into a person. And how do we work across those different silos that exist in government to actually solve for problems that a person has, 
not what we think society has. Because society is make, made up of a lot of individuals and each individual has a challenge and we have to figure out how to solve to that challenge. So figuring out where those models and where those structures that need to change, for me personally, I think a lot about public and private. The public sector is no longer, and frankly hasn't been over the last 25 years, been able to pay for all of the challenges. And we don't really talk about the role of the private sector as much as we talk about public-private as kind of a concept. But we're going to have to think about where do the public and private have to think. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples where I think there's an opportunity here. One is to think about government and the private sector, whether it's public-private partnerships, whether it's the way government might fund, whether it's the way government might pri uh, partner with the private sector. I don't know what the right answer is. I do know that there are better answers for us to be thinking about how do public and private effectively work together. So if a government is paying for infrastructure, how can the government also pay for social outcomes of that infrastructure? So for example, um, the government in the United States, frankly around the world, pays for roads. Build, operate, how many of you use tollways? Right, government paid, private sector delivered. Private sector builds them, they collect the tolls for some period of time, um, supposedly it goes back to the government after some period of time, but it doesn't always go back to the government over some period of time. But to think about like, what, what is the outcome of that? What is the outcome of a toll road? Is it better traffic patterns? Is it faster movement of people? Is it reducing traffic accidents? What is the outcome of that road need to be? And are we paying for that or are we just paying for building and maintenance of a road? In New Zealand, I was telling um, some, of, uh, some of my colleagues at the table, the government, so much like California and much like other parts of the country in the United States, prisons are privately operated. Privately built and privately operated. In New Zealand, it is also the same thing, but the government is paying those private operators and builders for reducing recidivism. So what does that mean when I say that? If I am building and operating the prison, my incentive now is to keep people out of prison. You know how it's done today? The incentive is to reduce the cost per person in prison. It's like a hotel room. I want the highest occupancy rate possible in a prison because that reduces the cost of me operating a prison. The more people there are in beds, the cheaper it is for me to run a prison. Just think about that incentive. We're paying people to put more people in prison because it's cheaper to have more people in prison than less people in prison. And then, after that, the government is paying for programs to keep people out of prison. So what if the government were actually to pay the builders to keep people out of prison? How would you do that? In New Zealand, what they're doing is the builders of the prison are now redesigning a prison. The architecture is changing. How do I build a prison where somebody comes in and somebody can get out? So by the time they come in and by the time they leave, they're living independently already. So they're learning and the programming is integrated into the prison. The community is a part of that conversation of how to build that prison because the goal is to keep, never have a prison open again. So if that happens, the community owns that facility and it becomes an educational facility. So it's built like an educational facility. And the private sector is getting paid to solve a problem, right? When I say think about public-private differently, Let's think creatively of what that could look like. Maybe that's a testable proposition today. I don't think there's enough data yet to know if that's good or bad, but that's what research can do is to better understand if that can work over time. But that public-private is going to have to happen because the public sector by itself cannot keep paying for those costs because we don't know how to pay for them. And we're paying for programming, but we're not actually solving the institutional economic issues that, that are underlying it. So I urge you all to think really hard about where you want to participate. What I hope you don't do, what I hope you will do, and I have three requests for the students especially. One, please go work in the private sector. Because I think it needs people who want to think socially about the private sector. Two, at some point in your career, go work in government. It is supremely important that you understand what government does. They're not managing to the one million people who come online. They're managing to the seven million people who live in the city or the 300 million people who live in the country. 
And that is 300 million people with 300 million different ideas and different contexts and issues. So please go work in government because it'll some way or somehow it'll be interesting for you, but more importantly, those ideas need to come back into government. Don't just go sit in the private sector and then say, when I'm old enough and rich enough, I will come back into the private sector. Do it in mid-career because that's when your energy is the highest. That's when you have the energy to put in, and that's when you also can learn and adapt. Too often, if you're like my age and you go into government, you've already done your thing, so you think the world works in a certain way, but you also need the adaptation that's constantly happening, and you need younger people in, in government to do that. So I urge you to please go work in government someday. I think it matters a lot. And the third is, while you're in school, please pay attention to the research that's happening and understand how that research gets adapted into public policy and other places because that drives a lot of change and those all of those things are con continuously happening. So if you go work in the private sector, come back and understand what's happening in the research so you understand where that's going. If you go work in the public sector, come understand what's going on in the research and what's happening, whether it's at your university, other places that you live, where there might be other universities, but spend the time to interlink yourself. Don't get so siloed in the way society will silo you. Also make sure your life is unsiloed. And to get out of the consistent silos we tend to want to put ourselves in, take ourselves out of those silos and participate in the society in every way possible that you can. And I'm not, um, I'm not crazy enough to, to tell you all to you know, go do one or the other. I also know that we have to manage to our lives. We have our kids, we have families, we have homes. You're going to have to do all of those simultaneously, so I understand that. But at some point in your life, do, do think about your career in segments and not necessarily as just a linear path. Think about how might, how, how might you operate in multiple segments over time and use that as a way to participate. But relink back to all the work that you're doing now because just because you learned it today means 20 years from now that research will change again. Make sure you stay in touch with what's happening because it's important that we keep track of as society changes, what are we learning and how do we need to adapt with that. So thank you for the invitation and I look forward to your questions. So one of the, one of the questions that I have that, you know, in your experience I'd love for you to be able to answer is what, what primary barriers you've seen to, to social innovation either at the federal and or at the state and local level? So, um, uh, you know, social innovation is a hard term, and I know we talked about this. So are you coming at it from the private sector side, the public sector side, or the social sector side? So I'm going to talk about it from, from all of those sides a little bit. So the first I would say is just a trans, trans, uh, translational burial, translation, translating. How do we translate language? Um, too, uh, too often there's the... There's words that we use that are hard to translate to different sectors, and uh, I, one is from public to private. There's terms that the private sector uses, portfolio theory, ROI, um, that the public sector doesn't quite use, and we're trying to adapt to that, but we don't actually know what that means, so we end up saying words that don't, uh, that don't actually equate to what those terms actually are. So understanding that those terms are important and understanding what it is we're trying to achieve together is also important. So uh, the New Zealand example I gave you, you know, the New Zealand government, even, even when they were putting out this RFP, took four years to understand what the terms were that were equal that the private sector would understand and what they were saying, so to make sure that they were having the same conversation. So similarly, the same translational problems happen between government as a funder, philanthropy as a funder, and nonprofits. Mm -hmm. So nonprofits, you know, they, you know, it's funny, um, they use data, and they're always adapting to what those communities are, but we don't always translate that to what is it that, that government is looking for or philanthropies are looking for. And making sure that those translations are also happening are equal. So there is time for transition to happen. So it's not like, oh, you're not looking at data, therefore you shouldn't be funded. But how are you looking at data and how might we transition you to that process? So those conversations aren't happening. And sometimes, and I think the unequal level between government and nonprofit, especially in cities, is... Um, the government is largely the largest funder of nonprofits. And it, you know, I would just give you an example of New York City. New York City spends $20 billion a year on social services. There is no philanthropy spending that much money in one city on social services in the way that the government is. And they are the power broker. 
So at the end of the day, we may not like what the nonprofits are doing, but they're also delivering what the government has asked them to deliver. So if the government wants to change and if that, we need to understand the power relationship that's happening and how do we have that translation between those two things. So that was one of the biggest barriers that I saw in social innovation. And then the second I would say is the structures of government, at least from the world that I was living in, were not prepared for innovation. So they had to manage to, and I think this happens in cities, that happens in communities. Mm -hmm. City councils have certain requirements of what they were looking for. State legislatures have requirements, and then the federal government has requirements. And so if you're trying to manage to all of those that were happening, um, we need to understand how is the government organized to also change those requirements, not just what the government wants to do, but the fact that in the US at least, um, it, you have to change le the legislatures. Frankly, globally, internationally, it's very different. So in, in uh, Colombia, mm -hmm. the mayor can make a lot of decisions and things happen. Right. In, in, uh, you know, in Houston, slightly different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have to think about how, how those uh, management structures are different. Well, we might return back to the idea of management for innovation, um, maybe in some of the other Q&A, but I'll leave that up to my my colleagues here in the room. The other thing that I was really interested in, this is some of the work that you're doing at Beck, is to think about the term social impact at scale. Yeah. Um, because that even that is language that's embedded with different kinds of connotations yeah. depending on the communities you come from. So I guess my question is, when, you're, when you use that terminology, so social impact at scale as a goal, what is it that you have in mind? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, as with all good social innovation, we're also changing ourselves. <laughs> uh, we started out with an idea of what scale meant in terms of how to scale what works mm -hmm. and, uh, and use kind of what were the barriers of scaling what works to more and more evolving to ecosystems matter for scale. Mm -hmm. So any one organization can't change everything, but you need to think about where the ecosystem mm -hmm. works. So who's taking leadership? Uh, where are the um, where are the philanthropies, foundations, mm -hmm. private sector? Where are the where's the money coming from? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the data we're using to think about it, and how how does that work? Um, and then, is there are there enough people to actually make that change mm -hmm. happen? So, I, I think when we now when we're thinking about social impact at scale, we're thinking about what are the ecosystems that need to change around yeah. in order for something to scale because. It's almost unfair to ask one organization to change everything. Mm -hmm. um, organizations can scale, but that still may be that the limitation mm -hmm. is the ecosystem itself. Okay. Well, that's really helpful. Maybe I'll, I will just get back to that point about managing for innovation and how you see it as different at the federal level versus at the local level. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so ma managing innovation at the federal level mm -hmm. is thinking about how large pools of money can be spent on innovation. Okay. So uh, we can't direct, you know, 50% of all federal funds go as direct transfers to cities and states. Mm -hmm. Direct transfers, no questions asked. So um, they don't really, they're, they're not, as much as we sometimes think the federal government is restricting how dollars get mm -hmm. spent, very little of it at, in the direct transfers are, is, is restricted mm -hmm. dollars. It's just a direct transfer to the state. The state decides how the money, um, how, how the money yeah. is spent or the other is direct transfers to communities and the communities can decide how that money is spent. So thinking about how to create better incentives in those structures as that money gets spent is, is one, without being too federal centric and the government right. saying here's how you have to do it, but giving the tools and then allowing the cities and states to figure that out. So that's, that's uh, one part that the government can do. The second part I think is, uh, as I said earlier, is, is, is the convening power. How do we convene different groups together mm -hmm. so they can learn from different other communities? So it's too often, it's funny, something is happening in North Carolina and no one knows it's happening in Chicago and you know, mm -hmm. Illinois. So are there learnings that we can take from those? I mean, can we explain or can we show people what are the processes mm -hmm. by which to do that? So I think the federal government has two roles. One is how the money gets spent. Mm -hmm. And the second is um, convening and allowing to spotlight right. the things that are happening. Mm -hmm. At the city level and at the, at the, even at the um, district level, it's much more real, mm -hmm. right? Every mayor has to solve a problem and it does not matter what political party you're at. You're just like, you're dealing with real problems right. on a real time basis. Housing, education, mm -hmm. transportation, 
food, you're dealing with it on a daily basis. So when, when we think about social innovation at a city level, it's really application-based. Mm -hmm. What's happening? Why does it work? Where did it work? What were the challenges? How might you change that? What do you need to change? But you're changing more rapidly and more, uh, more interesting. So I think the challenge for cities and I think for mayor's offices is really thinking about how do you organize for innovation? Mm -hmm. And then how do you allow some of those uh, adaptations to happen and then you know I know y'all are doing some example some work with the city already so how do you take those learnings and how does policy change right. right not just we had great examples but how does a policy then change because those examples you know illuminated some great yeah. ideas or po points like that so how to how to live both simultaneously that's great that's very well stated can I like to introduce uh, or give you the opportunity my colleagues in the room to ask Sonal some questions did everybody hear the question? Um, he asked uh, about uh, talking about impact investing. So, uh, what are the trends in impact investing, and then uh, what are the what's what it will it take to actually help it scale, and what's the ecosystem that's required? Did I capture your question? Um, so, I so impact investing, much like social innovation, is a little bit of everything to everybody. So I'll start with impact investing can be for nonprofits, and impact investing can also be for for profits. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just talk about the, the ecosystem of that a little bit. So one, in nonprofits is how do I finance differently that allows me to scale when a program works? And could uh, private dollars participate in that? That comes across as things like social impact bonds, um, pay for success. But it's largely continuing a nonprofit model, but thinking about how can private dollars finance uh, for social outcomes. So that's that's one way of thinking about impact investing. The second is uh, social enterprises. So businesses that do good, but also make money. So that can be uh, Revolution Foods, where they're providing healthier meal options in schools. It can be um, organic foods in low-income communities that don't have access to grocery stores. Um, it can mean lots of different things, but it's really about the private private market working and, and thinking about. The, the challenge in that space has been we've always talked about it as below market returns or above market returns, right? So everybody's like, oh, if you really want to invest in low income communities, it's below market returns. And I think we haven't yet challenged ourselves enough to think about what are the business models that work and what are the public policy changes that need to happen. So, and why I say this is, let me give you an example. Um, ExxonMobil does not succeed without government subsidies. It's a business model that requires government subsidies. And, I, and, and it's not a negative to ExxonMobil, it's just understanding the models to ExxonMobil. If you are doing deep sea drilling, the government is giving you subsidies. If you are exploring new ideas, the government is giving you subsidies. So why is it possible that now when we look at social impact, we're like, no, no, you shouldn't have a subsidy, but the big companies should. So we have to think about what business models are making the big companies succeed and what business models are making small companies succeed. How many of you have been following the Amazon um, where they're going to place their next? Um, right. So the world's richest man is asking cities to give up their money to place their headquarters somewhere. Do not believe that companies aren't getting subsidies. All companies get subsidies. The question is how much. So when you are then competing at the social impact space, why are those subsidies not equally available to lower income communities as they are to richer communities? And that's the question I ask us because that's the debate that is currently happening in social and in, in impact investing. It's all below market returns. So if we want to make it above market, should we have a should we have government policy in that space that makes it market marketable or not? Or should we be taking below market returns because it's still the right thing to do as a government and that's a question um, I think we have to ask ourselves. And then the last is there's a lot of movement and we're seeing this especially on the asset management side of company industries asking businesses now uh, what they're doing for social impact. So businesses, companies are starting to have to ask themselves this question. Walmart in their last institutional investor call, investors were asking them what their social impact was and how they were measuring to it. So it's going to shift how companies operate once the investors start asking these questions. And that question is starting, that trend is beginning to happen. Companies are starting to take much more leadership, more than the government is. And I think we should pay attention to that. Walmart in the last three um, hurricanes has embedded themselves with the city on how to get, in, they're in Puerto Rico, 
They're in Miami and they're in um, Houston asking how to open up transport routes to allow for goods to process and how do they help the city do that. So I'm not saying that they consider that social impact, but I'm saying that by doing that, they are already having social impact. So we should be paying attention to where those are happening. And are those public-private models real? Are they PR? How do we think about it? These are important questions. But that's where the trends are going. That's why I think thinking smartly about public and private is going to go a long way. So I made the mistake of not asking people to introduce themselves. So I don't know if you would just introduce yourself, if you're an undergraduate, graduate student, one of our community partners, faculty, et cetera. Uh, Daniel Salalian, practitioner. Great. All right, thank you. Um, I love the idea of redefining what we mean by below market returns. Uh, so ne next question. Yep. Excuse me. Oh, there's a microphone. Hi, uh, I'm Chris Rico. I'm the director of innovation at the LAEDC. It's the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation. Um, and with my purview being innovation, I wondered if you have given some thought since you came from Silicon Valley and then went into government and have been on both sides of how do we solve for the deification of tech entrepreneurs versus social and civic entrepreneurs? Because, you know, Silicon Beach is sort of the, the area of LA <laughs> that's kind of, you know, notorious with innovation. I look at Silicon Beach and think, there's really not a lot I can do as one person in the county for them. But when I go to South and East LA, there's a lot that we could be doing to help those underutilized communities. But nonprofit leaders are not afforded the same kind of luxury of blowing through $7 million worth of seed money and then being glorified for failing. Yeah. So I wondered if you could comment on that. <laughs> can I come work for you? <laughs> um, First of all, it's, it's great to have you here, especially from an economic development corporation. I think those are, uh, for those of you that may not know, but that's an, it's one of the most important aspects of a city in thinking about how economic development happens in the city. So I, I think it's a great question. Um, it's funny, we, we keep saying we should allow for failure, but we don't really, as a nonprofit, you don't get afforded failure, or as a social sector leader, you don't really get afforded layer, uh, for failure. Um, I don't know the answer to it. So what we did in the, in the federal government is when that happened, we just provided protection. We had money available for testing ideas. And if they failed, we just adapted to the next idea that needed to happen. I think it's going to take government leaders to allow for some of that change to happen. I don't think it's going to come from the private sector because they, they, their cost is more expensive in the sense of PR costs and what they have to deal with. But I think the government has the ability to afford a little bit of that and learn from it. Um, I also think the press needs to learn how to operate in allowing for failures to happen because I think a lot of times in government we're afraid to take risk because we're afraid the next press story is going to be a bad press story about how it affected the community. But what I would challenge us, and I just say I think this is a, it's a theoretical idea, so let me just put it out. But how do we allow the community to be a part of that test and failure and let them tell the stories versus the way we generally operate in government is we're going to tell you how to do it and then we'll manage the press that comes out of it. I find that communities are actually much more resilient and willing to be part of failures than, um, than we allow them to be. And when they do do that, I think there's some really great learnings from it. There's a really great initiative here in California called the Family Interdependence Initiative. Um, that is run by, uh, he was a MacArthur fellow, and he does this where he gives money to the communities and lets them spend it. And when they fail, he just lets them fail and lets them learn. And it's funny how resilient and adaptable they are to those failures and how they change in the process. But we have to be willing to give faith to failures in, in letting the communities own that failure and not just the government or the institution owning that failure. But that also requires us changing our operating model to allow the community to be a part of the process. And I don't think we do enough of that. And I know Anne's doing some of this research, but I don't think we do enough of that. But I think that would be great to learn how we can allow that to happen. Um, but it is hard. We're not going to become Silicon Valley. We should not kid ourselves that we're going to be Silicon Valley because it's private dollars. Right, it's just private dollars going away. It's not public dollars. And public dollars are expensive dollars because each of us pay taxes. Each of us wants our dollars to be spent properly. Each of us wants to see success happen. So if we want to use those public dollars, we need to talk to the public about how to use it. Hi, ma'am. Uh, Captain Shana Thompson from the Air Force ROTC Detachment. Um, being in the military, I'm kind of in a liminal state between public and private. Yeah. Um, I exist where I work for the government, but I engage in private, uh, in the private sector as a, as a citizen, basically. But I, I know that in the military, we have the lowest ranking person 
um, who still is afforded a certain amount of benefits. And so I wondered, when you were talking about outcome, uh, with the private sector having a singular outcome of making more money um, and having that, that focus goal, does the public sector need basically a singular outcome in the sense of a basic standard for everybody as far as what a successful community looks like, but also what a successful individual's life looks like? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you are wading into the very public debate that is currently going on called universal basic income um, about should we be giving everybody a basic income and then every once you have a basic income, you have the ability then to think about everything else. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't have a view on this, but I've seen both sides of this debate where one part of the community is very much about give everybody a universal basic income. There's another part of the community that says, but what about human dignity? If you're just giving basic income, are we really giving people a chance into the economy? Are we saying, oh, we now give you a basic income? You still have to, but everything else and the rules operate exactly the same way. I think it's a both and process of, we have kind of sort of universal basic income, but we don't actually talk about it that way. It's called social services in multiple different formats. But if we were to turn that into an income and we gave them cash, maybe they might operate differently than if we made somebody go get housing assistance and food assistance and uh, job assistance and we make them go to 50 places as opposed to just giving them an income and letting them do that. Internationally, there's a lot more of that happening. So in Mexico City, in uh, Kenya, in Rwanda, in Ghana, they're testing this out already where people are just getting cash transfers and the cash transfers are directly where families are doing this, where families are operating differently. Switzerland's going to try it. I don't think it's going to, I don't know that it's going to pass there, but it's a much harder conversation in the U.S. because we have a very strong belief that we should be pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. And that's a challenging question. I think it's a question that in a conversation we all need to be ha having, which is what does pulling yourself up by the bootstraps mean? And how often do we all have the same luck at the same time, right? I, I will I'll give you my own example, right? My parents came from India, uh, emigrated. I grew up in a very, uh, you know, middle-income family. And, but a lot of my choices and chances that I had were luck. People I ran into, someone who gave me a chance, someone who, you know, afforded me an opportunity. Um, I could say it was skill. But there were three other people or 10 other people that had similar skills. I just happened to know the right person at the right time who helped me. And I think we have to be honest about ourselves and saying um, success isn't always just about all the skills we have, but success is about the networks we have. And if we do the universal basic income, are we also opening up networks for people? So it's not just basic income, but also giving people the same access to networks that others have. And we need to have that very honest conversations with ourselves about it. So I really liked your very simple framework for how to kind of address the social innovation problem as a whole, which was just person by person, look at every need they have and is it covered? And You probably have a different threshold for who needs what. I, this might be too broad of a question, but I was wondering if those areas like health, housing, et cetera, if any of them are relatively more difficult or if there's a most difficult one and if there's like an easiest problem based on the tools and technologies we have right now. I don't, I think it's going to vary city by city and community by community. I think in some places it might be housing, in some cases it might be, so San Francisco it might be housing. Um, and in Houston it may not be housing, but it might be food. Um, but it, I think it varies slightly in where those communities are. Um, I don't, I think our challenge is uh, we need simple frameworks, but in complicated structures. And we're always looking for simple frameworks, and we think the structures are simple. So we've got to be willing to think about complexity of, of, of lives and simplicity of structure, and how do we manage to uh, solving problems in, in both of those simultaneously, because it's not quite as simple. I do think, though, that technology has a real opportunity to help us understand what's adapt, what needs to be adapted faster and how, but we need to be able to look at that data smartly. And we need to be able to combine data sources to allow that to happen. Um, we haven't quite figured that part out yet, but I think, you know, when we think about Internet of Things, think about that, not just what robots are going to take your jobs, but think about how do we integrate data sets to allow us how to help people more effectively, and where, where are they falling off the system, and how can we be helpful at that point in time. But my guess is Gary does all the housing stuff, so he can have a better answer to your question. Well, even our own provost, as you know, has established you know, that the university is going to focus on four wicked problems, right? And so the term wicked problem is a term that came from the 80s about these problems that cross silos that have no identifiable source, single source, et cetera. And, 
And so when you think about it in the context of how government approaches these questions, you can think about the issues like homelessness is a, you know, one of the four, right, which addresses housing issues, economic stability issues, kind of criminal justice issues, mental and behavioral health issues, right, all these kinds of issues. And our systems, as you were talking about before, often have been siloed, where we are operating within those kinds of silos. So if we're going to move from a kind of delivery system to a adaptive system, as you were talking about, then we do need to think about what that looks like. And what is the new ecosystem? What's that adaptive system that enables us to address those kinds of problems, where the social innovation actually might be the structure to address the problem, as opposed to just, here's a new singular idea that can fit within the single system, especially if it doesn't operate there. Yeah. So how do you take a customer-centric approach? If the customer is a citizen, how do you take that approach? That would be the question I would ask. And the social structure. Hi, my name is Kaylee Kennerson. I'm also an undergraduate student studying business with a minor in nonprofits, philanthropy, and volunteerism. I'm actually here with a class of around 20 students studying social innovation. So thank great. you for being here today. It's been very great to like hear more about what we're learning in class. Um, but my question is, you kind of mentioned, especially for us students, to kind of start in the private sector to get that experience. And then eventually, your hope is for us to move into government. How would you recommend kind of making that transition? And do you think that? There's many sectors, so there's state, um, like city, as well as federal. What do you think would have the most benefit if our main goal is to eventually make an impact and move into the social sector? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't have a great answer for that, because actually maybe I started wrong in the sense of not everybody has to start in the private sector. <laughs> you can start in the social sector, move to the private sector, and vice versa. Um, but I don't, um, I, I, gave, I started personally in government first, and then I went to the private sector, um, started a nonprofit and then came back into the public sector. So uh, there's multiple ways and pathways to do that. But one thing I would say to you is I think if you decide to go to the private sector first and then you want to come back into the social sector and government, when you're in the private sector, participate in those structures. So it is about whether you go to city council meetings, whether it is you participate in community organizing. Not, I don't mean like active you know, advocacy, but in, in community activities that happen at the city level. Do you participate in the Economic Development Corporation in your community? Where are you going to participate? Because that's your avenue into knowing that sector and groups. We live in our social groups. So the government folks tend to work with government folks. Lawyers tend to work with lawyers. You know, Economists tend to work with economists. We tend to like that. But you're going to have to force yourself into those structures a little bit bit more and find ways to participate in that. For those of you that think about kind of working in government as working in a city or working at the federal level, also think about just, you know, at some point um, running for city council. You know, do you participate? Because that's really where the rubber hits the road and the money hits the road. You're really actively making decisions of where that money gets spent at a very local level. And those are not small amounts of money. School boards, city councils, um, you know, uh, state legislatures, you're really spending real money and you're really making allocations of real money. And that's not a full-time job actually, but it is partially like participating and being a part of that. It's important because that's really where the change is happening. We tend to think that the federal government is really where all this big change happens. And really where the change happens is when the city council spends money differently or the mayor does something, you know, the, the council working with the mayor does something differently. That's really where the, the rubber hits the road. So don't underestimate the value of that um, and don't always just think about federal office as the only way to make a difference because I think actually city office and state offices are much more um, much more where you have real impact on lives something that we talked about last week uh, we were doing kind of a group case study was um, in terms of government funding when it came to medical research in the social innovation field mm -hmm. and uh, the differences in you know you have rare diseases that might not get a lot of funding um, that are sort of forgotten about we use the uh, example of sickle cell um, in class and how, you know, obviously they're not getting the same amount of funding that a breast cancer research um, would. And I guess my question to you is, when you were working in the field and still are, how do you prioritize who the government should be giving money to? And how do you kind of decide this issue is going to be more important? And because the way that we looked at it was like a sickle cell is kind of getting forgotten because it affects a minority group. It's not as, you know, in the news, uh, not as many people are affected by it. So how do you decide who you're going to give the money to, how much, um, and which issues ultimately are the most important? <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great question. Um, ask me in 10 years, and it'll be a different answer. Um, I, you know, I think we're learning, right? Over the years, it tends to be um, big issues, big advocacy, advocacy campaigns, big, 
you know, communities coming together and saying we want the government to do X, Y, or Z. Cancer is a big one right now. Um, it, that's when the government, but the government and NIH, to be fair to the NIH, actually funds really interesting research across the board that not a lot of people know about. So the, the beauty, I think, of both the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health is that they actually fund new research and new ideas and other things that people may not pay attention to in a way that the social sector doesn't always do because there's no research funding available for that. Most of the money that's available in the social sector is to do evaluations or new programming models, but very little in kind of fundamental, interesting new research. And I think the sciences do that. I don't think we do a great job, and we haven't done it globally, of funding for diseases that are for the poor. Um, or, or communities that don't, and that's why the, when the Gates Foundation set up its big, um, dis, you know, uh, with Agavi, it was for global vaccines for things that we would not fund for, like malaria. Malaria is a poor person problem; it's not a rich person problem. So we were not funding for vaccines for that because we didn't think that it affected enough middle-income wealthy folks who would pay for it. Somebody's got to pay for the vaccine. And so what the governments did is the research was taken on by Gates and others, but if the vaccine was developed, the governments agreed to pay for buying some number of vaccines from, from that. But that was a really interesting public-private partnership. Really, the foundations and private sector put up the money for the research, and then the governments agreed to do the offtake if the research actually got to a vaccine. Um, and that might be something that we should think about domestically as much as we think about it internationally. Should we be looking at public-private where the private sector can partner with the government to buy it if the research gets done for sickle cell anemia or others, um, other types of diseases like that, that we can, that, that largely affect poorer communities um, and thinking about that. I know the government thinks about this a lot in terms, but there's so many demands of so little money of like which of those diseases do you choose to pick and which ones do you not choose to pick. It's not just cancer. There's a lot of money spent in a lot of different places. So where would you think about it and how might you think about it? But maybe we need to rethink how that gets allocated and where it gets allocated and which are the poorer diseases that we will not spend money on or time on if, if there isn't a structure that allows us to force ourselves to get there. So um, part of it is also getting out of our own silos, right? And knowing that there are other diseases out there. You know about it because you studied it but not a lot in the community think about where are those diseases. So we, maybe we also need to be honest about which ones are we looking at because what gets access to information. And I think for you all as students, that is your biggest challenge. Right? There's so much information coming at you at one time. And y'all are looking at it so many different platforms, everything from the traditional platforms of newspapers to the Medium Post to the Huffington Post Post to I don't even know what else of the other things are out there. But y'all are getting information from so many different platforms. What are you going to trust? And where are you going to go? And how are you going to know what's happening in communities that are outside the worlds that you live in um, and understand that? And I think that's a challenge that all of us face, but I think y'all's is even bigger because uh, you have even tremendously more access to information than we did when we were growing up. So I think that's going to be y'all's challenge. And I think that's a question I would ask of you and to say, how do we build those structures to know about that in the future? So I'll thank you for your, your insights. Um, I'm, I'm actually wanting to uh, channel a comment that was made um, by Preston McAfee, the chief economist of, of Microsoft. And oh, sorry, your background. Your name. <laughs> thank you very no much problem. for the reminder. Brandon Shamim, uh, practitioner and alumnus. Um, I wanted to ask you, he, uh, you know, Microsoft obviously advancing the field of uh, AI and user-based uh, on-demand information. And what was so fascinating is he was saying, are we creating a dystopia as we move towards uh, AI technology? Now, I think everybody in this room would agree that you know, social innovation is presented in a positive context. But I'm curious to ask you, what are those inadvertent non or unintended consequences that you might see or have seen from social innovation advancing itself? Mm, great question. Um, you, you went in a different direction than I thought you would go in when you started with the AI question, so it's a great uh, uh, mindset shift. Um, look, there are lots of places where I think, um, let me start with social innovation as it's, it's a way of thinking as opposed to a solution to a problem. Um, it's a way of thinking to get to solutions. It's not the solution itself, and too often we're looking for the silver bullet solutions that might come out of it versus the way of thinking to get to 
a, a solution. So I, I, my definition is much more on the way of thinking and much less on the solution itself. Um, there are tools like social impact bonds, like impact investing, like data. There's lots of tools out there. I think our challenge is as the field is moving rapidly, both from a technology perspective and other things, um, recognizing who it's actually helping and who it's not really helping. Too often we can think about social innovation and we name the 10 organizations or 20 organizations that have national prominence, but we don't really think about community-based organizations that don't have national prominence but are actually doing really good work. And too often we leave those out because we're like, oh, they weren't a big name. Oh, they didn't get the MacArthur Genius Award. Oh, somebody didn't know about them. Our validation sector, our validations are based on what the press chooses to validate rather than what we choose to validate in a community and in the places that we live. And we actually need to catch ourselves because um, we like winners and we don't like to find those winners that are not within that realm of winners that somebody else has already identified. So I think we have to catch ourselves on that. And more often than not, we leave out minority groups than we do majority groups. So majority groups that already get access to money get more money. Minority groups who are doing really innovative, creative ideas never get access because they're not big enough, because they don't say the right language, because they don't know the right terms, because they're not in the networks. And it goes back to networks again. They're not in those networks. And it is in our interest as social entrepreneurs, social innovators, to make sure that we're expanding our networks and allowing more people in and not boxing people out, which is the natural instinct. And I've been watching this field for a long period of time, right? I'm watching for everything from Ashoka to Echo and Green to Skoll to, and I see how those networks box people out. And we don't, and we were like, those are the winners. The everybody else was a loser. But, you know, there were a lot of people that made it into the process that may not have won, but they were doing some really cool stuff in different places, and we should learn from them, and we should understand that nobody goes into the field of social innovation because they're going to make money. They go into the field because they want to do the right thing, and we need to understand that doing the right thing comes at a cost to everybody's lives, too, and that we need to respect that and not, not, not walk away from that. So I think that's one bit that I think we have to catch ourselves on. Um, but my question, and I think for all of the young people here, is technology is changing the way social innovation is going to operate, and we have to think about who's coding that technology, how it's being coded, and whether we're going to magnify the inequalities and inequities that currently exist or whether we're going to code it differently. And I don't think we're even having that conversation in the social sector. I don't think technology is even a part of our conversation in the social sector. Um, every inequality that exists can become technologically faster. And, and I mean, like, how do we decide who's credit worthy and who's not credit worthy? Um, how do we decide um, who is a good credit rating and who has a bad credit rating? How do we decide who gets access to housing and who doesn't get access? To and a great example of this, and I just want to use it as an example, not because, and I think they're doing something about it, but just to be fair, Airbnb. How many of you use Airbnb? Right, me too, right? Airbnb found when they were doing their research internally that if you were African American trying to get Airbnb, you are more discriminated against on a regular basis because you have to show your picture. That is just what society does anyway, and it got magnified through technology. Right? We need to think about that because we need to actually ask those questions in the beginning of the building of the technology, not after it's been built and then try to fix it. What happens in the social sector is we're fixing the ills already done, as opposed to thinking about how do we take human nature and adapt to it today. And I urge all of you that are thinking about technology, using technology, participating in technology, think about that coding today. Infrastructure is destiny. If that infrastructure gets built, we're stuck with it. If that infrastructure is built without thinking through those questions, we're stuck with it. We have to think about how it gets built differently. Well, I, I just want to echo this, the idea of thinking of social innovation not as a product, but as a process. And as we're thinking about how do you actually create structures to allow those processes to happen, you know, one of the things that your question on sickle cell came up is, you know, obviously something you said it dropped out of the community consciousness, but I'm sure if you're a member of a certain community, it's not out of your consciousness, right? So what is broken in our structures? What needs to be innovated? Sometimes it's not, again, a product, but it's a, it's a structure, it's a process to, to deliver the kind of social outcomes that we're talking about here today. 
Um, just as we conclude, um, I, I wondered if you had any other kind of innovations in structure process, et cetera. Um, you had mentioned the really interesting example in New Zealand about a payment by results idea. Um, is there any others that you have seen that have gotten you excited? Maybe we don't know enough about it yet to say whether that's going to be a promising pathway or something, but something that you're keeping yeah, your eye on. It's a great question. Um, t th three that I'm paying attention to, one is in Bogota, Colombia, the way they are managing their transportation mm -hmm. policy and how they're thinking about transportation in a completely different way. So mm -hmm. it's not a top-down approach, but really think about where the communities are and mm -hmm. how they rethink transportation. Uh, the second is actually just the government of India and how they think about the Aadhaar program and how they're digitizing every person. 1.2 billion people have been digitized and how they're going to do payment of services through digitization. Um, so you you automatically get a bank account, you automatically get your payment. So almost um, the universal basic income where it's just automatically going to them. They don't have to go to the institution to get it. They're getting it. So I'm watching it because they're testing out mm -hmm. a model that is could fail dramatically or could work in a very interesting mm -hmm. way and I don't know what that which, yeah. where, where it's going to go uh, where it's going to go with that and then the third is actually Tanzania and Kenya where they're playing around with mobile money in a different mm -hmm. way and thinking about how mobile money works directly and what's fascinating when you think about money is every one of us has a bank account right so every time we do money we go through the bank and we don't, uh, but their money and the way they're doing the mobile payment transfers mm -hmm. is I can send money directly to you without having a bank account. It's like a transfer of, I'm using cell phone minutes as a monetary mm -hmm. unit and that, that doesn't require me to have a bank account but now we can do transactions in a whole different way. And I think the, the final technology that's really fascinating and uh, just keep your eye on the field, especially in the social sector, is blockchain. The underlying technology that is below um, Bitcoin. So bi there's Bitcoin as a currency, and then there's blockchain as the technology yes. itself. And how we think about using blockchain for land rights, how we think about it for refugee financing, which is one we're following right now. And uh, and and a third is like educational records. Do you have to? call your school and get a transcript, or can it just be on a blockchain and I can pick it up because it's a transparent mm -hmm. process? So there's kind of disintermediation that's going to happen mm -hmm. in this technology, and there's going to be winners and losers, but who are going to be the winners and who are going to be the losers are going to be an interesting time to see, and who gets, who gets, uh, who gets left out and who gets in. <laughs> well, can I just ask everyone here to join me in thanking Sonal Shah for providing this critical conversation today. Thank you. Thank you.